Hi, and welcome to our Facebook Live discussion. I'm Stephanie Stapleton, an editor here at Kaiser Health News, and this is Jay Hancock, one of our senior correspondents. And today we are going to talk about the high cost of prescription drugs and especially about what the drug industry might do in, to push back against attempts to control these, these costs and to address this policy issue. If you have a question or a comment, please post it to our Facebook page. Now, Jay, we're 10 days into 2018, and already there's been a lot of talk on this issue. Um, in the Senate yesterday, there were confirmation hearings for Alex Azar, who is President Trump's pick to take over the Department of Health and Human Services. Mr. Azar is a former drug company executive, so Democrats definitely were pressing him on what he was going to do about the cost of prescription drugs. But there, in, in addition to all of this talk, there's all this talk, but I'm wondering what you see ahead in terms of actual policy in the months ahead. Yep, yep sure. Um, Mr. Azar's hearing has picked up uh, the drug price conversation from last year, and essentially it's continuing uh, the way it has for the last two years. You know, we saw these um, incredible scandals uh, the last two or three years of huge price increases and really obnoxious drug company executives uh, sort of making fools of themselves and trying to justify mm -hmm. the unjustifiable in terms of these price increases. And uh, the Azar hearings has sort of picked that right back up. I think 2018, we're going to see more conversations like that. Despite the fact that uh, drug price increases as a whole have actually slowed down a bit. We saw these huge spikes um, a couple years ago related to hepatitis C drugs. Now that that's sort of been built into the system, drug prices are still going up, often well over the price of inflation, uh, but the rate is decelerated and um, that's a talking point for the pharma industry. Nevertheless, this conversation is uh, is going to continue. Where are we now? Um, there's like three different landscapes that we need to pay attention to. Okay. One is in here inside the Beltway. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of discussion a year ago about drug prices surrounding President Trump's inauguration. Remember, he called drug companies, said they were getting away with murder. I do remember that. Mm -hmm. Implied he was going to do something about it. A lot of expectation and talk about well, was Washington going to do something? You know, there's bipartisan criticism of drug prices, not just Democrats. And even some analysts on Wall Street were predicting some kind of substantive action here in, in Washington. Um, discussions mainly revolved around importing drugs from Canada, where uh, the prices are regulated and they're much cheaper than they are here, mm -hmm. the, the pharmaceuticals are. Um, and the other thing that was discussed a lot was letting requiring Medicare to negotiate uh, drug prices for um, its many, many members. Um, there was also talk of an executive order coming out of the White House last summer, a lot of anticipation over that. None of this ever happened. Nothing pretty much uh, got done here in Washington. And so, um, let me correct that, nothing got done in uh, the legislature, in mm -hmm. Congress, or in the White House. There is incremental movement in the Food and Drug Administration, has a new commissioner named Scott Gottlieb, also has an industry background. Mm -hmm. He has won praise for helping speed uh, generics to market, for um, getting the word out where generics don't have competition. There's hope that uh, that, that will have some effect, but generics really aren't where the action is in terms of prices, in terms of putting pressure on all the payers that are trying to pay for this stuff. So in the absence of a whole lot going on here in Washington, states have started to take the initiative. Um, states have a big dog in this fight. They, uh, uh, they have a lot of very large Medicaid programs that have to pay these costs. And they also, a lot of uh, their politicians, again, on both sides of the aisle, see this as a political winner, and so um, a lot of the action, both in terms of influence by the pharma industry and policy considerations by lawmakers, is shifting to state capitals, and we can get into more of the details later. Right. And just to add, the action isn't just in, in the form of legislation, but also there have been state ballot initiatives that we'll talk about as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, totally. 
The other thing that also we can't overlook is the fact that 2018 is a midterm election year and there's going to be money that points points some direction in that way as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when we have um, all this continuing interest in drug prices, all this discussion, uh, combined with the fact that it's uh, a midterm election year uh, for Congress, but also a lot of state races uh, are going on, that's sort of going to combine to bring um, a big storm of influence seeking by uh, the pharmaceutical companies and their trade groups uh, this year. And uh, that's also going to be a theme. Okay. So just for a minute, let's take a step back and we'll talk about the things that did and didn't happen in regard to drug pricing last year, meaning 2017. So states are talking about doing things this year, but they've already taken the initiative. The first big proposal that got everybody's attention, especially the pharmaceutical industry's attention, was uh, an initiative in California two years ago um, that turned into a statewide voter referendum that California is sort of famous or, or infamous for. Um, this particular measure would have uh, required the state and its Medicaid program to pay no more for pharma prices than the Veterans Affairs Administration on the federal level, which gets a big discount. Mm -hmm. uh, that went down in flames after a big, big $100 million pushback by the industry. Um, but California came back. That was in 2016. 2017, the California legislature passed a uh, drug price transparency law. And as we'll see, there's a lot of... Um, measures in other states under the sort of transparency label. Uh, what this law would do, and it passed, and Governor uh, Brown signed it, um, if pharma prices rise at, uh, if they pass a certain threshold, it gives the state uh, power to, uh, to seek uh, justification for that. It would also require the drug companies to disclose their price increases if okay. it's past a certain level. So that's California. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ohio had a similar referendum to the one in California that would pay veterans affairs prices. Uh, that also went down in flames, uh, defeated by a, a, a very wide margin. Um, there was huge money in that as well, right? $50 million, mm -hmm. which is, you know, this is Ohio. It's a right. big state. It's not California. It's still a ton of money. Right. spent um, when you, it's a, it's a lot more economical to influence legislators, you know, mm -hmm. when you have a few dozen legislators in a state house, when you're talking about influencing millions of voters and getting the message out on, on that wide of a basis, um, you have to invest uh, some decent money. Um, so uh, what else happened last year? Maryland passed a so-called price gouging law, mm -hmm. which would... Uh, again, give state regulators the power to increase their scrutiny if uh, they deem that drug prices are going up uh, too fast. New York took a little bit of a different tack. Um, like every other state, New York has a, a, a huge Medicaid program for low-income people whose pharma costs are high and rising uh, quickly. Um, New York uh, passed a law that would... Uh, give uh, policymakers uh, the power to come in and scrutinize um, drug practices, drug prices very closely if uh, drug prices, again, breached a certain level. Uh, it would sort of trigger uh, this greater scrutiny from lawmakers and theoretically give drug companies an incentive not to crank up uh, the price meter so fast. Right. So, so we've had some wins. Where do these wins seem, for the yeah in the the state at the the state on the for the people who want to do something about drug yes, prices exactly uh, those wins. losses for the drug the, industry exactly thank you so where does that seem to be translating into movement in the year ahead we're going to see a little bit more of the same and basically the the categories uh, are a little bit of the same of uh, the ones I just mentioned we're going to have drug price transparency measures. The basic idea of which is, when you get down to it, to shame the industry into not raising prices so much. It wouldn't regulate drug prices. 
it would cast more light on prices. So, mm -hmm. for example, the California law that would require a filing with the state by drug companies if they raise prices a certain right. amount within a certain mm -hmm. amount of time, that would trigger a filing, which would trigger press coverage and um, perhaps embarrassment for the companies. The idea is that um, drug prices are very murky. We really don't know, uh, like a lot of items that we buy in healthcare, we don't know what what the final price is. The idea is, if people only knew how expensive they are, that um, that might uh, go some way in mitigating the increases. The other category that we're going to see this year, I think, is again what New York, uh, the New York law, which is use a state's Medicaid program and its buying power um, to um, gain a little influence over drug companies to, um, uh, in the most extreme cases, to negotiate, okay. uh, to develop an exclusive drug list and exclude some drugs if, uh, if the prices are too high. Um, we're going to hear that talked about in a lot of state capitals. Now, which of these is more doable? Or seems more doable based on the experiences on the ground. The 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 most doable measures are the transparency measures. Um, they don't uh, come out and tell the drug companies what to do. Um, but even those are going to get very very strong pushback. There was a bill in Louisiana last year that um, would have required uh, drug sales reps to disclose the prices of uh, their newest and greatest pills when they're marketing these, when they're promoting them to doctors. And uh, the, the bill would have required them to say, oh, and by the way, doctor, this will cost for a 30-day supply, this will cost your patients and their payers X amount of dollars. Right. The drug industry fought that amazingly fiercely, and uh, we're going to see that with transparency bills uh, elsewhere. Um, what the transparency measures have going for them is there is bipartisan uh, support. Even conservative Republicans who don't want to regulate prices um, believe that a healthy market should uh, include knowing what the prices are, what everybody's paying. Those have the best chance. Right. Now, are there states that look to be particular hot spots? There's so much going on, and it's hard to keep track, um, but there's just a lot of action, even in... Utah, very conservative, uh, mm -hmm. deep red state. You're hearing discussions, no formal proposals, but people are talking about uh, importing drugs from Canada, which was talked about on a federal level right. uh, last year, where the drugs are less expensive. That's a, you know, that's a pretty radical thing for Utah. I don't expect anything to happen there, but it's an indication of how much uh, how much action is going on? We're going to see um, more discussion in Maryland. Mm -hmm. Maryland, very liberal state, already mm -hmm. has this price gouging bill, which I should have added applies only to generics. Mm -hmm. They're going to try to get that applied applied to brands. There's t discussion there about including uh, drug prices under Maryland's health care regulatory system, which sets right. prices for hospitals now, which would be the most extreme measure by a state yet if they did that. I don't think they can get it done, at least not, not this year. Um, South Dakota is talking about a veterans affairs law like the mm -hmm. ones that California and Ohio rejected. Um, we're going to see transparency bills or at least discussion about transparency in uh, Connecticut, Michigan, Oregon, Washington, New Jersey, and I'm sure that's not even a complete list. And um, New Mexico, Massachusetts, Arizona, and Tennessee are talking about uh, limiting drug coverage or limiting prices paid under mm -hmm. their Medicaid programs. So lots of activity. Lots going on. Okay, and we now have a question from one of our viewers. It's from Shelby, and she asks, in hearings before the Senate Health Committee, prescription benefit managers, their PBMs, and we're going to talk more about them later, just as an aside, have been questioned about their role in the supply chain. Do you think lawmakers' eyes are revising their role? Or is there another factor in the supply chain, like the manufacturers, who should be under higher scrutiny? Well, we'll talk about this later, uh, but everybody should be under scrutiny. Um, the PBMs, the, the pharmacy benefit managers, are essentially insurance companies. 
uh, for prescriptions only. And they're middlemen, basically, and they make very high profits. And uh, as Shelby points out, thank you for bringing it mm -hmm. up, Shelby, because it's actually something we're going to get to uh, mm -hmm. in a little bit. Um, they are uh, farmers trying to shift the gaze to them to avert uh, any finger pointing at the manufacturers when, in fact, um, scrutiny needs to be made all around. Right. That was actually going to be my next question, just that in terms of how this debate is breaking down, it seems like the the drug industry side has been using this messaging strategy where they want to expand the players in the supply chain and they want to expand who all has a piece of that pie and who all is responsible for the drug cost. So we've touched on it a little bit for Shelby, but can you further break down just mm -hmm. exactly how that works mm -hmm. just so we can get that's complicated? The way it works is uh, the number one uh, rule if you're a PR operative uh, for a healthcare company or a healthcare trade group is blame the other guy. Healthcare is super complicated. It's got all these players, doctors and hospitals and nurses and PBMs and drug manufacturers and insurance companies. And uh, everybody participates in the high cost of healthcare. And so the first rule is if you're coming under scrutiny, find somebody else to blame, find a scapegoat. Right. In this case, the PBMs, the pharmacy benefit managers, um, have become pharma scapegoat and um, perhaps a pretty effective one because um, they are not uh, transparent organizations. A lot goes on uh, behind the scenes and they're pretty profitable and those profits get factored into the cost that everybody, taxpayers, employers, insurance customers have to pay. Okay. Um, and if you are just joining us, I'm Stephanie Stapleton, and this is Jay Hancock, and we are discussing prescription drug costs. If you have a question or a comment, please post it to our Facebook page. Speaking of which, we have another question. This one came earlier from Jennifer, and she asks, do you track pharma's lobbying spending on a state-by-state -state basis? It would be interesting to know how it compares before and after key bills are introduced in state legislatures. So I guess she wants to know if that kind of data is available out yeah, there in the absolutely, universe. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. To my knowledge, uh, it is not. Um, on a on a state-by-state -state basis, there are 50 state capitals and... Um, States tend to compile their own lobbying disclosure and campaign contribution disclosure on their own websites. I haven't found um, a great one-stop shop for activity in all 50 states. Having said that, I can answer uh, your second question, Jennifer, which is how does lobbying compare when uh, key drug price bills come up? Um, and the answer is it zooms, it, it, it booms, mm -hmm. it goes up in a huge way. We're looking at this and follow, follow Kaiser Health News because we're doing some more um, reporting on this. We're looking at how it's going to play out in the state houses this year. Mm -hmm. um, but we looked at um, some of the initiatives uh, last year and um, it just goes uh, nuts in a big way. And maybe we should talk a little bit more about that, uh, um, about, just, you know, you want to get into the... I think let's do it. Uh, yeah. The, well, the... just as background, Jay has been doing a lot of work and reporting on the drug and industry, the spending habits, the messaging, sort of the PR campaigns. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could give a little background on what some of the stories you covered were and what conclusions mm -hmm. you drew. What were the conclusions mm -hmm. that you drew? The headline is um, Pharma Worried Spending Bigly. <laughs> uh, uh, last year, so um, nonprofit trade groups have to file disclosure with the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, the biggest pharma trade group is called Pharma. It's an acronym that stands for the Pharmaceutical, Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. They are one of the most powerful business lobbies in Washington. They've been around for decades. 
they were really, really active around Obamacare almost a decade ago, nine years ago, when Obamacare was being discussed and negotiated, uh, pharma really ramped up its resources and became a huge player and actually negotiated a deal for Obamacare, which would pretty much leave pharma to do whatever it wanted with drug prices, and then they became a big supporter. They sort of ebbed after that, um, but now we're seeing a, a surge again in the 2016 activity that we just uh, saw was pretty impressive. They um, they increased their dues. They, they saw that a fight was coming. They saw all this discussion about drug prices. Uh, they saw it was bipartisan. They saw it was spreading to the state houses. And so they did a cash call. They increased their dues from members, and they took those dues and deployed them in many, many different places. Their revenue uh, hit $270 million dollars. In 2016, it was the highest level since Obamacare, and we've seen indications that when we get the uh, when we get the numbers for 2017, that will be even more impressive. Right. Um, but um, they're um, they're sort of spreading it around. Um, they are pharma has uh, lots of different tools in its box that it can do uh, with this money. Um, one is uh, political contributions, uh, is where some of that $271 million went. Uh, another is uh, state house contributions. Right. So as we see the initiatives shift to the states, um, we're seeing pharma's uh, influence seeking shift to the states uh, as well. Now, let me just, just for context, I'd like to know how how do their, but the, the pharma budget lines compare to other health trade organizations, say the American Medical Association or the American Hospital Association and maybe other large lobbying organizations in general? Pharma's, um, to my knowledge, pharma is the biggest healthcare industry player in Washington. Um, bigger than the American Hospital Association, uh, larger than the AMA. They're more profitable. Mm -hmm. um, I did a calculation a few months ago of uh, profits for the top 10 U.S. pharma companies, and they made something like $300 billion in revenue during 2016, and they booked more than $80 billion in profits for uh, that same period. That's like a 27%. Yeah profit margin. And so with those kind of numbers, you can afford to uh, wield some clout. Pharma plays in the same league as the biggest, biggest business lobbies. For example, the United States Chamber of Commerce, which represents all businesses and has a huge membership. Um, Pharma really plays in that league. Um, they've been big. They're getting bigger. Right. Now, what were some of the, the big ticket campaigns that you saw when you were looking at the line items in these disclosures? Sure. So um, we may have seen, viewers may have seen last year uh, what Pharma called its Go Boldly mm -hmm. campaign. These were very, very well-produced ad, TV ads showing heroic pharma scientists discovering miraculous new medicines and... Uh, quoting the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas on mm -hmm. not going gently mm -hmm. into that good night. And the implied message was um, nobody wants to go into that good night, and it's worth paying lots and lots and lots of money and high prices for pharma to uh, to try to fight that off and not go gently. That was a super expensive campaign. We've only seen so far the $7 million or so that they spent in 2016 on preparations for the campaign. We haven't seen the actual spending metrics yet, um, but it will probably be uh, probably be very large. Um, but pharma, as we said, it it has lots of places uh, mm -hmm. to spend money. Um, one of which are these state house races that we uh, that we talked about. Um, and you want to talk about patient groups? That's what I was going to ask you next. Read yeah. your mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, everybody knows the American Heart Association. Everybody knows the American Lung Association. Everybody knows the American Cancer Society. 
What they may not know is that these groups who uh, whose mission is to represent the best interests of patients who have these diseases and their families and people who care about them um, get lots and lots of money from pharmaceutical companies. Sometimes it's for research programs. Um, a lot is just for general funds. Um, some of the largest numbers that we saw in uh, the IRS filing for 2016 were for um, the auto, American Autoimmune Related Disease Association got $260,000 from Pharma, the trade group. The Lung Association got 110000 Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation got 136000 And the Lupus Foundation got $253,000. These are large chunks of money um, going to patient groups whose members, in many cases, uh, are having to deal, along with the people paying their insurance, with really high pharma prices. Mm -hmm. And uh, the groups get lots of criticism regarding the, the conflict of interest this represents, um, because uh, what critics say is that it, it stifles criticism from the groups who should really have the patient's best interest at heart and be in the front of the line of criticizing high drug prices. Um, and yet, we don't see it. Um, I should mention that uh, the patient groups deny this. They say that they have policies in place to uh, prevent conflict of interest, um, but it's hard to imagine that, uh, that the money doesn't uh, buy something other than just uh, good feelings. Now, just to speak to my wonky side for a little bit, mm -hmm. um, I wondered if you could also talk a little bit about the source material for some of these findings. I think they're called 990 forms from sure. the Internal Revenue Service, sure. just so people get a grasp of where you're getting this information. Yeah. So this is Washington, and water flows like the Amazon River. Mm -hmm. I mean, money flows like the Amazon River. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for the botched metaphor. <laughs> And reporters try to keep track of this. And um, kind of like the, the listeners, uh, the viewers question about uh, state lobbying activity, there is no single source, unfortunately. There's um, money gets spent lots and lots of different ways. It gets donated in lots of different ways. One of the ways we keep track is um, through the required filings that nonprofit trade associations have to make with the Internal Revenue Service. They're nonprofits, so they don't pay any income tax. Uh, but they do, to justify the really, really huge tax subsidies that they get, they're businesses after all, they don't pay taxes. The IRS requires them to disclose what they're doing. Unlike a for-profit, closely held for-profit business wouldn't have to tell the public right. all their internal doings. These nonprofits do, and so, once a year, uh, they make a filing with the IRS. They are required by law to share them with the public. And so when they file them, usually in November following the whatever year that applies, uh, reporters like me start calling and saying, can, can you share this? And um, uh, Pharma's document is some 200 plus pages long. And to their credit, they disclose uh, much more than then they have to legally. Mm -hmm. They basically decided to disclose every check that they've written uh, to a small-time state politician in Topeka, to um, millions and millions to the Republican Governors Association, to uh, political donations to Congress. It's all there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what we looked at. It does give... Um, pretty good view of, uh, of their influence and what they're doing. And um, as I said, this was for 2016. Um, what, uh, what insiders tell us is that um, this kind of, we saw this surge in 2016. What we're hearing is that we're only going to see more this year. Uh, the continuing discussion about drug prices, combined with the fact that it's an election year, uh, should produce um, a very big surge, a very good year for lobbyists and uh, probably patient groups as well in terms of uh, getting pharma checks. Okay. Now, we have covered a lot of ground here today, a lot of topics, and I'm 
I think we're about to wrap up, but I'm wondering from all of this, what is the key point? What is your key takeaway from all we've talked about? Key takeaway, again, pharma worried, stepping up to the plate, trying to wield influence in any venue that they deem it necessary. And what that means is um, we talked a lot about what's going on in the states. We're going to see uh, lots of state um, action okay. by pharma, the trade group, as well as its uh, constituent companies. The companies don't uh, just sit back and leave all the work to uh, the pharmaceutical association. They get in there themselves. They make their own direct donations. Um, they have their own lobbyists. And uh, the state capitals are going to get a taste of that in 2018. Okay. Well, great. I think that concludes our discussion for today. Thanks so much for joining us, and we hope you have a good afternoon. Thanks for listening. Thanks.